ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hello, and welcome to Artifactually Speaking. I'm Brad Hafford, archaeologist and specialist in the ancient world. And I'm Tom Pedrick, historian of modern Europe. So, Tom, we've only just started this series, but we're already having a lot of fun with it. In each one, we're bringing in two artifacts, but they're recent artifacts, which sounds like an oxymoron, because we tend to associate the word artifact with something ancient. But in fact, anything that is made or altered by humans is an artifact. Absolutely. And we're trying to bring out the stories, because every artifact has multiple stories, in fairly recent objects. Sometimes we have things that we find in our own attics that we want to learn about our own family's histories. Other times we might pick something up at a flea market or an antiques fair or something like that and be curious about it and want to do some research. And I love doing that because it makes me engaged in studying history rather than just opening a book and learning dates or names. I can actually be a part of it and try to get towards the people who maybe made that object or held it or used it. Yeah, your approach makes the study of history a lot more tangible, doesn't it? Well, I hope so. And we've kind of said that we're defining an artifactualist, which it's not really a word. <laughs> but We made it, is, it one. Yeah, what we're doing is acting like journalists in a way. And we are asking questions of objects. So we alter the journalist standard questions of who, what, when, where, why, and how by starting with what. We want to know what something is, and that seems obvious, but in fact, it turns out it's not really. There are multiple answers to every one of these questions about any object that you look at. Nothing is as simple as it seems. Indeed, because a what can be not just what is it, but what shape, what material, what symbols, what meaning. And in fact, I like to look at objects that are used, you know, that, that have seen a life. Now, this is what makes our artifactualist different from, say, an auctioneer or a, an antiques dealer or a high-end collector. They want objects that are pristine because they're extremely rare. And those things that might be 100 years old but never touched, they are so rare that they have monetary value. We're not talking about monetary value here, though. We're talking about history, historical value. I like things that have seen a use life because then I can start to think about the person who did use it, who enjoyed that object for what it was meant to be. Or the many people who might have handled it, who could be very different. Exactly. So there are many what's and many when's. When was it used by the first person? When was it made? When was it used again, perhaps? When was it found? So... We're going to be looking at two objects that are related in time or place or both. And today we're looking at quite recent objects, really, something like 50 years ago. They are related to, though, a very important event. It's what we all talk about as the space race. I want to talk about my first object, which, in fact, I'm wearing. On this tie, I have a tie clip. And... I'm going to show a close-up picture of it so that we can get a bit more, and it is our first official artifact. This is, really, it's a tie clip. Some people might say a tie pin, but it has this alligator clip that you can open up and clip the two parts of a tie together so that it doesn't flop about in the wind or whatever. I'm going to switch to a close-up camera view so that we can talk about the object and see it more closely. We can already see that it is related to the Apollo 11 launch. And we have th therefore answered that question of what. It's a tie clip. I'm going to show the back where the uh, alligator clip is. You open it up and put the tie between. And the when now we can see pretty clearly because it's Apollo 11 launch, which happened on July 16th of 1969. It's a very specific date. Of course, this was made a little bit earlier. It was distributed to the launch team. And the Apollo 11 actually landed on the moon 20th of July in 1969. The where 
Well, it's the launch team. So it's primarily in Cape Kennedy. At the time, that's what it was called. It's now called Cape Canaveral. It's in Florida. And there was a launch team of about 450 people involved in this launch alone. There were other teams that worked in Houston Communications. They had uh, engineer specialists at MIT in Boston. And in fact, for the entire Apollo program, there were some 400,000 people that worked for that. The idea of just sending a few people into space or onto the moon took a huge number of people and it inspired imaginations all over the place. So these were given to the launch team, the ones that say launch team on them. Those 450 people all got them. But many were made without that inscription on them and they were sold to anyone who wanted to be a part of them. So it really was also a commercial item which is a really great transition for our next item. The Fisher Space Pen, in an act of celebration, also became widely commercially available. Indeed, and I want to show that one. So this is our second official artifact. We'll go to that. Yeah, the Fisher Space Pen was a specially designed pen that could write in the zero gravity of outer space. It was used, it was created and initially used roughly in the mid-1960s, but a little more about that later. It was initially used in outer space, but since it became commercially available, it could have been used by anyone who bought it. But to understand the why of this object, that's quite interesting, because in order to do that, we have to address a historical misunderstanding. Now, there's a persistent myth, which is kind of funny, that says the American government squandered millions of dollars trying to create a special pen that could write in the zero gravity of outer space. But in response, the Soviets just used a pencil. Yeah, I think I've heard that story. And it's kind of humorous, really, because it sounds like Americans spent so much money to accomplish something when all they really needed to do was use a pencil, isn't it? Right, right. Well, it's just not quite true. So both space programs early on tried using pencils. NASA tried using a mechanical pencil. The Soviet space program tried using what was called a greased pencil. Neither one worked. The mechanical pencil has pieces of graphite that could break off. They could either, I don't know, get in your eye or get into a piece of equipment, which, if you're flying around in space, is absolutely terrifying. The Soviet greased pencil wrote in smudges, so you couldn't really see what you were writing, and it made a mess because you had to tear back pieces of paper in order to keep using it, and they would fly around. And then... Both programs also tried regular ballpoint pens, but regular ballpoint pens won't work in zero gravity. You need that gravity to force the ink towards the the actual ball on the pen. Mm-hmm. So none of that worked. Enter private investor Paul Fisher. Fisher used about a million dollars or so of his company's money to develop a special pen, a gas charge pen, using pressurized nitrogen to write in outer space the pressurized nitrogen would push the uh, ink to the actual ball. And he presented NASA with one of these models first in 1965. He had already spent all that money from his company. NASA did not spend that money, right? So NASA looked at it, did a little bit of testing, and finally approved it in 1967. NASA bought a bunch of these pens. And actually, the most interesting fact I've learned in doing this research The Soviet space program bought a bunch of them, too. Really? Which is actually kind of funny and pretty cool if you think about it. Yeah, an American entrepreneur invents something, and it gets used by the Soviet cosmonauts, even though, as we will get to in our larger theme here, it was kind of a competition, really. It was a space race. Absolutely. And I think this is one of those cases, you know how they say life is stranger than fiction? History is more interesting than the myth. Yeah. I think... Think, I'm still thinking about when we had a glance of that little that box, some of the cool symbolism that comes with it, too. It's really inspiring, don't you think? It is, and I'm going to switch again to my close-up camera, and we'll look at the pen itself, as well as the box. So uh, here, first of all, you know, the, the box shows the astronaut floating out in space. I don't think they did extravehicular on these missions, but right. <laughs> it's easier to show them uh, there. And you know, and Maybe they were pen. dreaming of it. They might have been, sure. They were thinking what, what could happen. So it says Space Pen by Fisher, and it comes with all of this documentation. It shows how that pressurized ink cartridge works. 
And I find that really interesting that it comes with all of that. And so I've got the cartridge taken out of the pin, and there, you know, it tells us that that's what it is, a pressurized refill. It's got this large area there that goes down towards the ball. And then the pen itself, you know, shiny and silver, and it's got a red and blue, white and blue sticker there. And then on the clip, it's got the actual command module of the Apollo 11. So that was the command and support module. And that released the lunar lander that went on down to the moon, while Michael Collins, the one that we don't hear as much about, he stayed up orbiting the moon to retrieve Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong when they came back from the surface. And of course it's gold and prestigious. That's some, some good symbolism too, right? Right. You know, the Fisher space pen, I believe, is still made, but it looks a lot different. This is one of the, well, I want to say original. Like you say, they were approved in 67. This one made somewhere around 69 or 70, I believe. Is that right? Right, right. It's still made. They have a an interesting website where you can purchase new ones. It's actually still used on the International Space Station. Really? NASA uses it. And the Russian and Chinese programs use them as well. Well, exactly. It can write anywhere, and that's great. But the newer ones, of course, don't have that golden uh, command module on them because the, the spacecraft don't look like that anymore. Right. You know, they have used names of a lot of mythological things in some of these. There was a Gemini program before it, and I have heard that because it carried two men in that module, that's why Gemini, the sign of the twins, the two people in the sky, you know, they use that name. And here, Apollo, maybe it is about Apollo dragging the sun across the sky in Greek mythology. That's a great image. I think it is. Well, back a bit to symbolism on my tie clip. I don't think it's all that uh, sharply made, but you can tell that that's an eagle. And that's a kind of reference directly to the lunar lander that was called the eagle. The eagle has landed. And it is flying down here, so here we have a literal eagle. There we had a, a space craft that was landing. But this bird is landing on the surface of the moon, and you can see the Earth in the background. You can see that it says launch team, and it says Apollo 11. The bird has a branch in its talons. It's very hard to see, but it is a branch, and I wanted to know more about that. So let's look at the actual emblem of the Apollo 11 mission. This comes from a press release, but this emblem is a little different from what we see on the tie clip. First of all, Apollo 11 uses Arabic numerals for the 11, and on the tie clip it has Roman numerals. It also has a slightly different positioning with the Earth over the eagle's head, where on the clip it says launch team, with the Earth moved below the eagle's wings. And you can see that branch more clearly now, and you can see the craters on the surface of the moon. The branch in this case is an olive branch, and the eagle is carrying it because it's a symbol of peace. And there was a plaque on the lander that said, we came in peace for all mankind. And that part of the lander is still on the moon today. So there are some differences. They made this thing to clearly reflect the emblem of Apollo 11, but it's not exactly the same. We're talking now about the how, really. How is this thing made? We're trying to get to the who. I do have an image of who could have or would have potentially worn this tie clip. And that image is of, well, it's probably a stereotype that's in my mind, of the sort of person who worked for NASA in the late 60s. They had short haircuts and short sleeve white shirts with a thin black tie um, and dark thick rim glasses. This is the sort of idea of maybe it was the nerd of the time. I don't know. I'm a nerd myself, but <laughs> in a slightly different time. The technician of the time. Yeah, exactly. And I do have a picture that kind of shows us something about that well, you can see that there are a number of people like that in this photo. And in particular, there are a few men in this sort of left corner here that I think represent it quite clearly. They've got the short sleeves, they've got the white shirt, the black tie, this man as well. And they're, they're carrying 
pocket protectors with writing implements and calculating tools. So this was what they did, was they worked in this launch room, what they called the firing room, I believe, and there were so many people needed to send men to the moon with computers that had the power of maybe a modern calculator or wristwatch these days. One of the things I really liked about this picture is, though, that even though this was largely a male endeavor in the launch room, there was one senior female engineer. She's right here. Her name was Joanne Morgan, and I'm very glad to know that at least one woman did make it into the senior ranks in the launch team at this time. I'm sure that she had to put up with a lot, but she did a great job, and she paved the way for many more women to work for NASA. Of course, in the Apollo program overall, there were women who worked just not in these senior positions. Oh, I'm glad we could shed light on her story and her contribution. Exactly. I don't know if she was given one of these launch team tie pins since women didn't wear ties, but I suspect she was. She was part of the team, so why not? So that's the kind of image that I have of uh, the people that wear it, but I have an even more specific example of someone wearing this kind of tie pin. Now, the firing room was very big, obviously, and there were multiple levels. And on one level uh, were people working for McDonnell Douglas, and these are those guys right here. And as we zoom in, we can see that he is wearing this kind of tie clip. It's kind of blurry, but you can see how it clips to it. You can see the circle, and you can see the angle of the eagle's wings. So I now have an even better idea and kind of confirmation of the kind of people that did wear this, that worked in the launch room, and that had these tie pins. Even if this one wasn't worn, it may have been worn a few times and then stored for 50 years. And I like to imagine that, that it really was on somebody's tie. So what kind of person do you imagine was using the Fisher pin? Because this isn't one that went to space, but it was one right. that somebody probably bought. The image that really comes to my mind is that a parent would have bought this for his or her son or daughter as a a act of commemoration to say you were alive during this and you can always remember it through this and also it's a neat pen that should be able to write underwater so why don't you try that uh, but there's also a chance that it could be there could have been a guy who bought it and said it's a souvenir and uh, I will just keep it in my garage maybe it'll be worth a ton of money one day someday <laughs> well the achievement of getting to the moon I think captured so many imaginations around the world really it was fundamental for that time. And Absolutely. I might not want to admit it, but I'm old enough to have been alive when it happened. I was very young. And I don't remember watching it on TV, but my brother does, and he's only a little older than me. And in fact, it wasn't just the US. Of course, this is a space race. The Soviets were also putting people into space, and they had early successes and were kind of winning that race in the late 50s, I guess, right? They had a number of firsts. Right, first man in space, the first woman in space, the first satellite. Exactly, Sputnik really started off quite the buzz, if you want. Uh, sure. 57, I think. And there were people like ham radio specialists that would listen to the beeping as it went past, and they'd be amazed. There's this thing in space, and people put it there. It's interesting, too, because Sputnik, for example, was one of those situations in which a, a real-world event gave an impetus for people to study the Soviet Union. We have to study the competition. Yeah. Well, I think it also got into their psyche, not just we must beat the Americans. I don't think that was the only thing in their minds. Obviously, they wanted of to course. explore space as well. And I have an object that reflects that, I think. This is a Soviet postcard from 1961. And the artwork on it, I find amazing. It, it reflects science fiction but they're already thinking about things like space stations. And today we have the International Space Station. It doesn't Absolutely. look like this, but... Right, right. Yeah. This says not only can we, can we get to space now, but we're going to get there and stay. Right. And that's pretty cool. And I agree with you. It does have that Isaac Asimov feel to it. Mm -hmm. I think your tie also has a kind of connection to this, right, for our episode yes. today. Yes, yes. And uh, just to... Remind everyone that Brad and I are sort of in costume today. <laughs> I have a replica of a nice. NASA tie yeah. that celebrates the docking of, in 1975, 
the American Apollo and the Soviet Soyuz. And it's Great. an interesting yeah. story. It's a, it's a more peaceful story of cooperation. These two spacecraft docked, opened up inside, and one astronaut put his hand out and one cosmonaut put his hand out and across the the vessels they actually shook hands in outer space which is wow. really fascinating it's a great image yeah to think yeah. about that you know the meeting of these two great powers in space yeah. well it gives me much hope and the idea of continuing space exploration i was well rather upset when nasa ended the space shuttle program but I don't think that's the end of space exploration. It's clearly not. The Russians, the Russian Federation, <laughs> right. is still launching into space. Yes, and their base in Baikonur in today's uh, Kazakhstan is, a, is the major portal to the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. Right. There are other programs, but that's the biggest one and the one that really does carry most things. And it's a beacon of hope, I think, because there are so many nations participating in the International Space Station. And if anything, it is truly interdisciplinary and international, I think that's it. And I hope we can build on these successes and really do it for humanity. Yeah, me too. And I, I think that's what I'm doing with these little objects. I'm moving from something pretty small and insignificant seeming and then tying it to things that were going on that I think still have impact today and making us think about a much bigger picture from something that's fairly small. You start out researching this one object and it takes you into bigger and bigger ideas. And sometimes if you start with that big idea, there's nowhere to go and you don't quite right, grasp right. it, I think. So. This way we can build our way up and ask all sorts of questions. Exactly. And there are so many more questions that could be answered, uh, or hopefully answered. They can certainly be asked. <laughs> yes, yes. There's so much more to learn. And that's exciting. And I want to keep showing that in our episodes. Each time we will bring in two things that seem fairly mundane. And I think we'll end up on something that is big and interesting and that can still have us thinking today. But I think that's about all the time we have uh, for this episode. I'm Brad Hafford. I'm Tom Pedrick. Join us again on the next episode of Artifactually Speaking. Until next time. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind.